Um, so yes, I've been here uh, for a couple of months as one of the residents downstairs, uh, and I'm sort of halfway through the residency. Um, and I'm going to talk this evening about, um, sort of a bit about what I've been up to, but really about just the stuff that I'm kind of thinking about the most, and I hope it's kind of interesting. Um, the title, which is one of those things where you're asked for a title kind of like four months before, I was like, of Rainbow Plains, and um, it's still sort of about that. If you don't know the Rainbow Plains, is this doing weird things, or is it okay? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, um, if you don't know the Rainbow Plains, this and the slideshow you were just seeing are the Rainbow Plains. Um, they usually go by that name on the internet. Um, I've been collecting them for ages. Um, you find them in, in Google Maps. They're not made by Google, but they crop up in Google Maps for reasons we'll get to. Um, and they look like that. And what they are are the artifacts of... Um, well, I was interested in them as artifacts of the way that machines see. So this is not how humans see planes. This is how machines see planes. It's a, a fundamental difference. Machines see in spectra differently to the human eye. Um, this kind of stuff's often called a glitch, which is a bit of a kind of reductive term, because a glitch can mean something quite um, opaque and just a simple error. Uh, and often a kind of just a catastrophic failure, something which we can't learn anything from. It may produce some kind of interesting aesthetic effect, but there's nothing to learn here. And then there's other kind of glitches, more like this, which reveal the underlying systems at play that allow us to kind of see below the surface image making into the ways in which images like this are constructed. Um, but I've only recently understood, actually genuinely come to understand, like why and how the rainbow plane. Um, I made these installations. Um, this is, they're called the drone shadows. They're one-to-one uh, -one outlines of uh, military un uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. This is one down here in um, Washington, D.C. last summer. Um, they're literal outlines of these planes that nobody sees um, as a way of kind of physicalizing an invisible technology. Um, after I'd done this one in D.C., um, I wanted to see if I could be get a better picture of it than this. So I bought satellite imagery of Washington, D.C. Uh, commercially from some people called Digital Globe, who are one of the same people that Google buys their satellite imagery from. So they're a company that owns satellites. In fact, they're, large, they're part owned by Google these days. They haven't always been. Um, and I could talk about ages about how extraordinary, fascinating, strange satellite imagery is uh, for many reasons. Uh, but the main reason, the main thing is to understand about it that's relevant to the rainbow plane and to everything else is that it's constructed. Plane uh, satellites and a lot of aerial photography as well, because there's lots of aerial photography in this, as well as satellite photography, it's not photography, it's image making. Um, it's image construction with processing and algorithms. Because these things don't have cameras in them, they have multispectral sensors, which are sensors that work across the electromagnetic, sen electromagnetic spectrum in a number of different bands. So while human eyes see, have basically three bands, uh, red, green, and blue, um, satellites have those, and then they have a whole bunch of other ones as well. Um, they see in the near infrared, uh, they see way deep into the thermal infrared, they see deep into the ultraviolet, uh, they see into a whole bunch of different spectra. Um, this satellite that I bought from uh, had, I think, nine bands. And the weird thing is when you buy the image like that, you download this like nine gigabyte image, and you finally open it in Photoshop, and it comes out entirely black. And you're like, well, what have I done wrong? And it took me ages, and I had to search, because no one, bu no one except big companies buys raw satellite imagery. Uh, so it took me ages of fiddling and working out why and how you separate it out into these different bands, and which ones are the visible bands, and how you therefore recombine them. So obviously to, to make a regular satellite image, you take the uh, uh, high definition black and white layer, and you blend it with these slightly lower definition red, green, and blue layers to produce a visible image. But you can also do other weird stuff. So this one here, which you can't quite see, is quite sort of red and green. That's actually a thermal infrared. And what you're seeing in there that's actually red in this image is actually mostly green stuff on the ground, because what it's seeing is chlorophyll. It's seeing living plant life. So that's a really useful band if you're doing kind of a geographic analysis of, of plant life, for example. This thing can see healthy plants in a way the human eye can't. But when you see things like this, that's because this is a multispectral error. It's combined the red, green, blue, and high def black and white images, but because this plane is moving so fast relative to the satellite on the ground that the satellite is focusing on, it produces this shift. And suddenly you're seeing this, this different way in which the image is constructed. And so bringing that through from this kind of intimation of machine village, uh, machine village vision, to an understanding of how that image was actually constructed, 
kind of a, a, a knowledge that I generated through kind of investigations into other areas feels kind of really key to me because I'm interested in kind of computer generated images in all kinds of places. One of my other great obsessions is um, uh, architectural visualization. So if, like me, you're interested in how technology shapes the world, then architecture and the built environment is a really fascinating place to start. Because it's really obvious that it really does shape the world. It's big blocks of stuff. And yet it's largely constructed through softwares, uh, increasingly. And these softwares are increasingly coming together into single systems, or at least single workflows and connected systems. You have a thing called building information modeling, which combines visualization softwares with CAD softwares with a whole bunch of other things to provide kind of a single complete software process from the conception of the building to it being built and then its maintenance afterwards. And the building is, is entirely dependent upon this software description. Um, and what's weird about those things is that you're combining a design process with the image making process. And the image making process becomes incredibly important part of it. Um, you know, which is why you see images like these, which I'm sure you've all seen on building hoardings all around London. Uh, and elsewhere, um, because as the architects, hopefully, quite often just planners rather than qualified architects, generate these architectures, they generate images along the way, and those images go a long way to deciding you know, how things will be built, and how we'll understand them. Um, I've been fascinated for ages, and the people that you see in them, they're always partying on their balconies. Um, we've, we've, um, the thing about these, these image-making techniques is that they, they shape the built environment just as much as the design process does. Because at various stages, these images are shown to planners, they're shown to professional clients, uh, they're shown to kind of other stakeholders in the scheme, and they shape their take on it. And so how you construct these images has a huge effect on how the built environment works. For example, something like, um, what well, an architect that I was speaking to, sorry, an architectural visualizer that I was talking to, called lorem ipsum architecture. So lorem ipsum is the kind of random text that you can generate on a computer to fill space. Well, architectural visualizers have lorem ipsum furniture and fittings as well. And they'll fill a space with it in order to show a thing to a client. And the client will go, oh no, I really like those green hoardings or that street furniture. And that will end up kind of coming out into the world, even though that's really an unintended consequence. And trying to understand these processes, I always tend to fix kind of on the people in them, because they're endlessly fascinating. This one's an anomaly, actually. This is, um, well, this one, this is a development, some Riverside development in Rochester and Kent. Well, that's weirdly Kate Beckinsale and her family out for a day's walk, and I, I believe this is one of the Olsen twins. Um, someone got bored in the office that day. Um, the, uh, the Olympics was a really fascinatingly rich source for stuff like this. They went kind of um, uh, full-on, kind of mega-inclusive. Uh, you've got a same-sex couple there. You've got this brilliant guy in the middle. Uh, you've got these kids. You've got this incredibly sort of domestic set of ducks flying through the sky, which I really like. Um, some are just kind of really plain weird. I've just been, I've collected thousands of these. You get these kind of weird toxic plants or fountain things. Um, there's always kids playing. So this is, that's a constant. You get these kind of repetitions of urban design that are fairly obvious. You also get these slightly creepy moments, uh, slightly disturbing imagery that appears. Sometimes you get this slightly different attitude or kind of awareness peering back. Um, but as all these things, it's just this kind of exercise in paying attention. So looking at the kind of, you know, the other things that are being constructed along here, alongside the built environment. Um, when you stare at them a long time, you start to have feelings about them. And I, I know architects have these as well. I have friends who have stories around some of these people. They put them into the images and they have their ideas about the lives that they live. I always think about this couple who feel like some sort of nice middle-aged couple who come in from, you know, outside London and sort of stumbled into this great metropolitan development and kind of aren't really sure um, what it might involve, kind of digital migrants. Um, but you also notice something else when you start these people, you see them recurring, um, this guy, for example. And the reason that they recur is, of course, that there are stock libraries of this stuff. There's loads of these people, um, and you can go and find them. This is a set um, uh, that's almost 10 years old now, guys called Real World Imagery. You sell high-def people you can put in your architectural visualizations. Um, it turned out that this set was, when I started investigating, it was incredibly common. Um, every architect I knew had used this particular set. Basically because it was, um, 
one of the earliest high def sets, and it got out. So you're supposed to buy it, but it got pirated endlessly. Everyone got a copy of it. And it was years before other things started to replace it. So, you know, these textures, these stock people, uh, you see them everywhere. Um, like, take this guy, for example, here in the white suit. Um, that's him on the High Line in New York, just in front of the new Whitney Museum. Um, or um, these guys here, that little bunch of group, group walking along. Uh, here they are coming out of the new Leadenhall building, uh, the cheese grater in the, in the city of London. Um, or these two, uh, can you see this little pair of guys walking along there? Um, here they are at Waterloo Station. Um, except, hang on a minute, because something really weird happens. They're slightly different to the guys in the stock photo, and I don't know when their heads were swapped. Um, <laughs> I don't know which one of these, this is from the set and this is from the billboard, and I don't know who's going around swapping the heads on them. All well, the complete weirdness of this guy, who's both of which, he's, he's from two different sets, one of which is business people and one of which is people on the weekend. Um, but they've obviously swapped his heads and I don't know why. And I, just, I got so into this set of images, I then got really bothered that someone was messing with them. That there's something else going on. It was starting to look like this world, like, this world of these people that I call the render ghosts, it was starting to look like it was kind of as weirdly constructed even as the world that it was generating. It was weird constructions all the way down. Um, but it bothers me when I kind of find things like that because I know this is constructed by people and software and people who make the software, software made by people. There's intentionality embedded in this stuff. There must be a history to these things. They haven't come out of nowhere. The world is not a terrifying, confusing place most of the time. And it's certainly understandable. It should be legible to us if we can think hard enough about it. Um, we should be able to kind of read the intent that's encoded in these technologies. We shouldn't just throw up our hands and go, ooh, the world is so complicated and doesn't move past these days. It's not good enough. The company behind these stock people is called Real World Imagery, as I said. Um, and according to their website, which actually went offline about a few months ago, but I've been slightly obsessed with this for a while, um, that is this here. It's on uh, a place called Grand Avenue Northeast in Albuquerque in New Mexico. Uh, it's a residential address. Uh, I emailed the company several times asking them about the source of these images and they never replied. I phoned them numerous times. The one time I got through, as soon as they, um, as soon as I asked, like, so tell me about the people, they hung up on me and stopped. They refused to talk about it. They were very uncomfortable talking about it. Um, so I started looking for the people directly. Um, I got this website where, uh, I've tried to collect as many of the people from that set together in order to find them. And I figured that if this company is based in Albuquerque and these are just regular people walking down the street, maybe they're all from Albuquerque, right? Maybe these guys just went out with a camera one day and snapped a bunch of these people in the late 90s and, you know, collected these images and been selling them ever since, which is possibly why they don't want to talk to me. Um, uh, so I ran Facebook ads based, you know, on the right demographic to see if I could find these people. Um, but it wasn't enough. Um, I, got, I got nothing out of this. Um, there was no access. So I went to Albuquerque in October of last year, um, which was brilliant. Albuquerque's awesome. I recommend the desert. Um, and I ran newspaper ads in local newspapers, um, and I put up signs um, all over the town. And, um, and I, I did go to that house that I showed you, uh, but it was locked up and there was no one there. And, and I was like running to this dead end. And, but to be honest, you know, as soon as I got there, I knew I was in the wrong place. Um, the thing you only learn by actually going there. These people are not from Albuquerque. They're not. They're, they're, it's the wrong dress, style of dress. It's the wrong kind of ethnic mix. There's a whole bunch of stuff you just feel when you get there. So what, New Mexico is a very strange place, actually, in lots of good ways, but it's not where these people are from. And then I got checked into a guy in a bar one night who turned out to be a local journalist uh, who'd been doing a lot of work on local civic corruption and had access to lots of weird databases about company information. And he showed me that real world had only moved to Albuquerque in the mid noughties And these photos were taken before then. It appears they had an office previously in Las Vegas. So maybe I'll go there next. Um, that, but like one crazy trip at a time. But so, you know, what was I gonna do? I was in um, Albuquerque. I come all the way to this desert in southwestern United States. And I was like, I knew the thing I've come here for is not here. Um, so I was kind of a bit of a loss and didn't know what I was doing myself. Um, the other big thing that's kind of from New Mexico, if you know this history, is the nuclear bomb. Um, this is from the, the Museum of Nuclear History, which is brilliant, but it's really terrifying. It contains a lot of bombs, and it's kind of amazing we didn't totally destroy ourselves. It's kind of, 
unimaginable what going to this museum that we didn't blow ourselves up. But one of the reasons I'm fascinated by the form is its, is its history, and particularly the connection of that history to contemporary digital technologies. So, you know, if you know this stuff, then we basically developed the first digital computers for kind of pre-World War or interwar targeting um, and, and munitions and artillery. Um, they got this massive boost up through the early development of the uh, Manhattan Project um, as, uh, as the first truly digital computers, not the kind of analog computers that we're building here, but the first truly digital ones built at kind of Princeton and elsewhere, which were used to calculate nuclear yields for the kind of first bombs and later the hydrogen bombs. And also there's this kind of, it's not, it's a bit more apocryphal than people like to make it out, but there's a link between the kind of decentralization of command and control centers that happens kind of post-war during the beginning, early Cold War and, and the development of the internet. They're both defense research projects along the same lines. It's not as, quite as neat as people like to make out, but for me the two things have always had this really strong connection. And so I thought, well, I'm at least, you know, so, so the heartland of the bomb feels to me a bit like the heartland of the internet. Um, and as I was there and I couldn't find the render ghosts, I decided to take them with me. So I printed out um, a couple of bigger ones, and we went on this kind of road trip through the desert, um, and we went up to Los Alamos, which is the home of the bomb, right? It's the town they built in order to develop the nuclear bomb. Um, and it's where they did a lot of this kind of digital computer uh, development, and it's where Los Alamos National Laboratories still are, which still do a huge amount of computer science research, all this kind of thing. It felt like kind of bringing one bit of the internet back to kind of meet another bit of it. It was a weird trip, as you can probably imagine. Um, and I'm still trying to work out what, what I was doing, was piecing all this stuff together. But um, I sort of realized something, at least, by doing it, which was that, you know, the main thing being when you get to Los Alamos, there's, there's not a lot there. It's a beautiful place. But the National Laboratory you still can't visit. Most of it's still secret. Most of it you can't access. And it's not the thing anymore, right? They developed the bomb there, but it's not the whole of the history. It's this tiny, tiny, tiny little piece. Um, and, you know, it's a bit like when I've tried to visit data centers before to try and, like, find the internet. Uh, that's not how it works. You can't, like, right, go and sit at the center of it. The internet is kind of like history, and history is kind of like the internet. It kind of happens all over. And it happens at this kind of other level. It doesn't happen discreetly in certain locations. Um, and all this, all the time, all the work I've been doing over the last couple of years has been this thing of trying to come up with new metaphors for the internet and for network technologies and for, for what I just always refer to as the network, which is like us and the internet, right? The things, the combination of those two things looped and cycled together. And all this time I'm trying to come up with better metaphors for that so we, we could talk about it better because I don't think we talk about it very well. And I kind of felt coming here that, that, that what I was trying to find wasn't like a better explanation for the internet, but like, and maybe I should be using the internet as a better explanation for everything else. It's like, why have we built the internet? Well, maybe we've built it as a tool, like the tool that we need now. The thing that we don't know what to do with it yet, but it's actually like this kind of super model of everything we've got to at this point. This weird machine that's kind of generating all of these new forms, we can then take and apply back to other things in turn. And if we're gonna learn from these digital practices, if we're gonna try and understand them and kind of refer them back to the world, then we're gonna start seeing more of these kind of disturbing echoes and commonalities between processes in the digital world and processes in the real world, like the term render, of course. <coughs> Architectural renderings, computer renderings, and other forms of rendering, renditions. Uh, the forms by which people are moved through different states, just as kind of digital files are moved through different states, transferred from one place to another, allocated names and addresses. You can easily see the way in which digital technology is kind of doing this to London, of course, by going back to those renders again. Um, the renderings, actually, when you look at them again with fresh eyes, they even more strongly kind of betray these intentions. This one's from, you know, Whitechapel. Uh, on, on, um, uh, it's a building called Cityscape that's right on the corner of uh, uh, Commercial Road uh, in the centre of, of Whitechapel, right? Um, and it's this kind of exclusive new address, luxury apartments, the full deal, this kind of you know, amazing champagne balcony thing as ever. You know, it's built on top of parts of the old Pettiphone Lane estate. There's no affordable housing, there's none of that. Um, we know this kind of gentrification, it's, it's weird to see it being constructed through these kind of imagery. Um, some are even more explicit. Uh, this is just up the road in Hackney. If you know the kind of weird fashion quarter that's being generated up around Hackney Central, um, it's called um, Hackney Fashion Hub, and it's worth kind of, ex well, 
looking at, if, if you see there's these kind of designer outlet stores now, they're planning this huge, vast development. Um, but if, if you look really, and, then, and there's all these promises of new jobs and all this kind of stuff, but if you look closely, you can see exactly what's going on. So like, you know, there's kind of these ratty buildings. This is the new building and there's kind of rattiness going on down there. And then if you kind of zoom into this thing here, you see how it all gets kind of tidied up with kind of like nice mature growth trees that aren't there at all. But also with, you know, a Range Rover and a Mercedes. We're beyond just putting in like virtual buildings now, we can kind of slap over these virtual cars and you know, why not put in a, 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 a businessman, you know, kind of on his mobile phone. And if you look closely kind of down the end of the street, you can see like an actual person just kind of disappearing or slowly being disappeared. Um, which for me kind of mimics the way in which so many Hackney residents have been kind of displaced, disowned, failed and ignored by uh, these systems in kind of recent years. Um, these renderings make me think of all the ways kind of people themselves are classified and controlled by these technologically augmented systems. And it was while I was thinking about all of that that I first heard about a guy called uh, Issa Muwaza. Sorry, Ifa Muwaza, even though the Guardian gets his name wrong. Um, Ifa was a uh, asylum seeker, a uh, failed asylum seeker. He came here about five, six years ago. Uh, he overstayed his um, visa. Uh, he went on to go for a bit. And then uh, when they detained him and tried to move him out, he went on hunger strike. Um, he's still fighting his uh, deportation. He claims that um, uh, he's under death sentence from Boko Haram, who are the really nasty uh, Islamic militants in Nigeria, and that they'll kill him if he goes back. Uh, so he went on hunger strike. And it was when he'd been on a hunger strike for about 100 days that they tried to deport him, but not the first time. And they, there was this weird story in the paper where he'd been on this kind of failed deportation, um, where they tried to fly him to Nigeria, and Nigeria had refused him, had refused to allow the plane into his airspace, so it diverted to Malta, um, where it stayed for a few hours, got into a fight with the Maltese authorities about the legality of them landing there, and then flew all the way back to Britain. So there's a guy who was seriously ill, uh, seriously Ill uh, MPs and people campaigning <coughs> for his uh, release or at least proper medical treatment who'd been flown on like, basically a 24 hour trip around Europe in this kind of desperate attempt to get rid of him. Not only that, this has happened apparently on a private jet, which is apparently how we're deporting people these days. And I was kind of fascinated by this, but also there were all these kind of weird bits of this story, like a private jet. Like, you get, why does the Home Office have private jets for deporting people, this kind of stuff? And I was just like, well, there's not enough information in this story, but I think I know how to find more information. Like, I think I know how to use systems and technology to gain more information about this stuff. Um, part of this, by the way, is a massive trip, Nick, from Trevor Paglen, who's brilliant. Um, uh, if you know his work, one of the things that he did um, when he was tracking CIA rendition flights was to make friends with lots of plane spotters who keep records of planes coming and going, and then use that information in order to spot kind of weird flights. Did a bunch of other stuff as well, but I thought the plane spotter trip was good. So I joined the Google group for um, Luton Movements, which is the plane spotters who hang out at Luton Airport, which apparently, according to the Guardian article, is where this plane had gone from. Um, by the way, plane spotters, I thank you for your work, but they're, they're as strange as you might imagine. Uh, they kicked me out of their group as soon as they found out what I was doing, because apparently um, they don't want to know who's on the planes. That's not what this is about. They just like the planes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else is their business. Uh, they do get a lot of harassment from the police, I imagine, so I think there's a reason for that, but still, they were not happy. Anyway, I looked in Luton, couldn't find anything at Luton. Um, but luckily, turns out there's also plane spotters in Malta. Malta's a much smaller airport, they don't get a lot of private aircraft. So, like, um, wherever he is, doo -doo -doo -doo, one of the, oh no, this was from another day, I didn't get a screenshot. But um, uh, anyway, jumping straight out of the middle of this one for the, for the right day was this private jet with its, you know, its affiliation and its, um, its registration number. And getting the registration number is the magic bit, because then you have a unique plane. Because then you can go to a site like Flight Radar 24, right? which is a freely available site, which tracks, which allows you to see basically all the planes in the air at any one time, because they've all got ADS-B beacons in them, broadcasting the location. And it also stores this information, uh, and you can access it free for days. So I was able to pull up the flight path of, um, of, of this deportation flight. Um, and I was able to see, you know, what company it was. Um, I was able to see this kind of crazy flight that it went. Um, this, is, this is from the um, uh, promotional video for Air Charter Scotland, who are, um, who are the people who leased the plane to 
uh, the Home Office, if you didn't catch that because it's not leaping, looping. Um, yeah, your freedom to fly is their is their check is their check line. They don't make so much of stuff on their website about how they're uh, deporting people in chains. Um, but it was good to find them. Um, it was a weird thing that I could do this thing using just free websites that no one else seemed to quite have noticed. So you know, I did the thing. I wrote it up on my blog, and it got reprinted in the New Statesman. Um, and then you know, and I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know about this weird private jet system. I didn't know about any of this stuff. Um, but I was then contacted after this or the article by a group called Unity, who are a group based in Glasgow who work with um, long-term detained asylum seekers um, and, and against deportations and various other things. And um, they said, you know, we're very interested in this area. Um, thank you for your work. And um, like, how the hell did you do that? And um, so I told them. And they also said, and by the way, and they got in touch again and said, um, by the way, we, there's another flight leaving next week. And what we do is we try and go after the companies who are renting these jets and to put pressure on them not to come involved, which is a fairly tried and tested activist technique. Um, and, uh, but the problem is when the deportees are issued, they're basically given a boarding pass a couple of days before they're due to be deported. Someone comes to um, the detention centre and gives them a boarding pass with like a time and a date on it, but it doesn't have like an airline code or anything. It just has like... No, a, a, a home office internal number, so you don't know who's doing it. And they were hoping that I'd be able to figure out which plane it was, but no. Like, there's no way to figure out a plane from a time and you know, departure date uh, for the whole of the UK. Um, so, but what I did know uh, was that a lot of the time, and I discovered this happened with the previous Ethan Mars flight, they used this place, which is the in-flight jet centre at Stansted, um, uh, which has a very flashy website. Um, and, and is basically a private jet park. It's weirdly hard to find. Uh, their address isn't on the website, you know, it's just for people who have private jets. And it's not part of the main standard complex, it's actually way around the back, you have to drive down these little country lanes past quite odd pubs. And then you suddenly find yourself in this huge car park with this kind of big um, private, private aircraft terminal. Um, and because I figured I didn't have anything to lose, that's how I ended up there, at kind of like, midnight on a very rainy Tuesday night, watching, suddenly, not being sure I was in the right place, until suddenly busloads of people started turning up um, with huge police escorts. In, in all, there were about um, six, there were seven coaches altogether. Most of them hired from these guys, WH Tours. One of them was brilliantly from a coach company called Just Go. Um, <laughs> and they all pull into this private jet terminal and start unloading people. Now, whatever you think of the British government's deportation policies, whatever you think of the way we do asylum policy in this country, immigration policy, a whole bunch of other stuff. All of which were issues I was, had feelings about, not entirely sure about. There's something about sitting in a dark car park uh, after midnight on a Tuesday, watching people of colour being unloaded off buses under police guard in the middle of the night, that slightly shakes your faith in the idea that this is the right thing to be doing. Something is, something is wrong when this is the way it's been done. You can read intent in these things. Um, I managed to, I don't know how, creep around a fence and get a photograph of the aircraft involved, and therefore was able to establish which was the aircraft, that company that's providing these floats. And you know, I managed to go around to another plane spotter's thing, where you can kind of climb through a little hedge and uh, photograph that way. And that's the plane as it kind of disappeared off into the darkness at about 2 a.m. But having that information meant we're back here again. We have a track. We have a, uh, a registration number. We have a company associated with that. And, we can and I can take that information back to Unity, and they can kind of fold that information into their campaign. But more than that, really, it's also about showing them that you know, this is something you can do. That this information is available and legible if you have the kind of tools to see it. If you can... If you can read the technology in certain ways and learn how to apply it. So, for me, there was something in this which is really quite similar to searching for the render ghosts. Something kind of quite powerful in this exchange of processes between kind of technological search and, and physical search, exploring at these different kind of dimensions and, and visualising it in, in different ways. Um, this is another project of mine that again feels kind of similar. It's called Dronestagram, and it's where I take the... Um, uh, data from some people called the Bureau of Investigative Journalism who um, research extra uh, judicial killings, assassinations by a drone in 
Yemen, Somalia, elsewhere. Um, I take the locations they research, I find them on Google Maps, and I post them back to social services like um, Instagram and Twitter and Tumblr and various other things. Um, because there's something extraordinary about the public tools that we have available to us that are tuned to be kind of separate from politics. That Instagram is this nice thing where you go to see pictures of your friends, but it's a daily dose of reality. You can put a kind of different reality in there. And while we've got a whole kind of secret war going on that we're not supposed to hear about, we've also got a company like Google that spent the last five years mapping the entire planet. There's no pictures of these battlefields in the newspapers, but you can take out your phone and see through satellites and visit them. That's a radical change in kind of what's possible to me. And it gives us the power to directly observe these things in a way that wasn't possible before, and just, you know, perhaps to intervene in some meaningful way. Um, last summer, I was doing a bunch of journalistic work, pretty much straight up. Um, I was writing for a news site um, about ANPR, Automated Number Plate Recognition, um, which, is, which is basically a cameras that can read your number plate on your car, right? I was really interested in it because it's massive. It's a huge, huge surveillance network. We in, in Britain invented AMPR. Uh, uh, the police absolutely love it. They really don't like talking about it, but they love it. Um, they won't even tell us how many cameras they've got. Uh, they certainly won't tell us where they are. Um, but um, they do have, um, they, they're putting it all over cars now. If you see th these guys, AMPR interceptors are around in London. Uh, but you'll also just see them on regular police cars that have these little black cameras on the back. They're recording every, the you know, license plate of every car that drives past them. They've also got thousands and thousands of these stationary cameras all around the country. And they've got five years of um, a huge central database of, of movements of cars around the country. So they're tracking, as much as possible, all vehicle journeys all the way around the country. Um, it's kind of this huge thing. Um, I, just, I just found it kind of extraordinary when I first discovered it, so I started researching it more. And while I was working on this piece um, last summer, suddenly all the NSA GCHQ stuff came out, uh, which is all about the same issues of uh, database algorithmic surveillance, um, you know, kind of uh, blanket information gathering. It's the same issues. And this stuff felt quite kind of provincial by comparison. You know, it's, it's kind of what the West Midlands police are doing. It's not exactly the NSA. Um, but I still thought it was worth investigating because it felt also like something we could talk about. Like the NSA GCHQ stuff is so abstract, so vast in scale, so planetary in scale, and so invisible and intangible that it's sort of impossible to have rational discussions about it. But this stuff, you can like point to a camera on a pole and go like, that's, that's a sensor, that thing is watching you, and that building over there is the one in which the kind of police are Thing, or you can watch one of these cars drive past you. Um, that, that somehow makes it possibly easier to talk about. Like, there's, there's a tangible thing we can point to, which is always the problem when you're talking about technology. Um, but here's what I, I really learned from, from studying that AMPR stuff, is that I know from technology and, and working tech that if you want to understand a system, then the, you need to kind of read its rules. You need to get as close to the code as possible. You need to kind of reverse engineer it to get deep into it. Um, you, you have to become literate in it, it's the only way. So I read a lot of legislation. Um, I wanted to know exactly by what rules this vast surveillance system was legal. Because um, it obviously was. You, you will say this, for the most of the time, the government police, they do obey their rules, but they also write them. Um, which is why they write stuff like this. So the two main rules covering um, surveillance of this kind are the Data Protection Act, and the Regulation of Investigative Powers Act, the DPA and REPA, as they love their names. And um, both of these acts are designed to protect your personal data, to protect you from all forms of surveillance and information gathering and all this kind of stuff. The DPA is largely for kind of protection from kind of companies and councils and that kind of stuff, and REPA is basically for the police and the security forces. And it says, this is what personal data is, and this is how you have to process it, and this is what you're supposed to do with it. And it turns out, of course, if you read both of those pieces of legislation, they both contain some very specific exemptions for vehicle data. This is the wording in Reaper, where it says, it has pages and pages of this is what personal data is, this is what private information is, this is what you can't do. Oh, and by the way, vehicles don't count, right? <laughs> Which is, let's face it, kind of counterintuitive. 
And I, I read a lot of kind of law stuff around this, and you get quite senior judges, when they talk about what the law is, they basically say the law is by and large what seems reasonable to the average person in the street. Um, they, you know, that's, that's basically what it's heading for. And this, this, this doesn't feel reasonable, it doesn't feel right that your car is not identifiable to you. Um, but that's what's in the law, right? Um, and that's been sculpted specifically to allow this specific technological operation. And you just get this feeling that it's kind of possible to perform a kind of like brass rubbing on the law, right? That we're kind of, by really close attention, you, you identify these kind of gaps or divots in it into which something that we haven't yet seen would be so kind of adequately fit, so perfectly put in. Like this is deliberate. It's that same intent over and over again. But you have to, you have to get really close in to see it. A lot of my ideas about this, which I'll mention briefly, were really inspired by um, a project called Subplan by um, a, couple of a couple of civic planners uh, and architects, but they work for Croydon Council, um, called David Knight and Phil Williams, a project that came out of a summer school at the AA uh, called Subplan, where they basically they performed a kind of close reading on the planning laws. And what they were basically looking for was the permission that we already had. So if you want to do any kind of work on your house, um, there's like very careful laws about what you're allowed to do right, and what requires planning permission. So they looked at all of the laws and they figured out what they could do without getting explicit planning permission. For example, if you've got a very crowded house, you can't build an extension out the side of it you know, very much without quite a lot of permission. It turns out chimneys aren't regulated in the same way. What's a chimney? Could you build a chimney that's actually kind of storage device? And what they do is they generate all these kind of insane structures, essentially. Kind of like kind of garden filling greenhouses that are kind of snakes and this kind of all this kind of weirdness just to point out the kind of the space that is available to us within within these regulations and what they're doing is they're kind of um they're pushing back at um to find the shape of this thing right in in again in computing terms in programming terms we call this fuzz testing fuzz testing is is basically when you throw a shit ton of random variables at a system and see where it fails you know, instead of trying to construct a perfect system, you construct a system and then just kind of feed it as much stuff and many different shapes and objects as you can and, and see where the edges of it are. Um, the drone shadows, so made me think of a kind of fuzz testing as well, um, with only one variable, admittedly. But it's the same kind of testing of those limits of poking at the thing. Um, this one's in Brixton, but when I tried to draw one in Brisbane in Australia last year, um, the state government stepped in and uh, blocked the installation. And it later became clear that this was because uh, Australia's a bit nervous about drones right now, um, largely because they're in a series of high-level negotiations with the US to buy them um, so that they can use them to enforce their highly contentious intern immigration policy by which they patrol the, um, the sort of edges of their ocean territory and uh, try to prevent asylum seekers kind of getting to land and then they offshore them because you might well have read in news in recent years, uh, days, it's sort of become a very present issue. Um, so th they were kind of tense about this, right? And they didn't want me to draw a drone. They didn't say that was the reason, but they don't like pictures of drones right now. Um, but the thing is, you know, what it took me so long to realize is that drone shadows aren't just like outlines of planes, right? They are diagrams of political systems. Um, by drawing them, we're kind of casting this light on these actors who would prefer their actions weren't made so clear. Um, and it's, and in that way, kind of, it's also another kind of rainbow plane. Um, in understanding how it is made, we kind of understand the world that, that has shaped it in turn. This is the letter that was obtained by um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism from the Home Office. And what it details is the um, deprivation of citizenship of a guy called Mohammed Saka. Um, Saka was born and brought up in North London, um, and, uh, but in September of 2010, uh, the Home Secretary tore up his passport, and in February of 2012, he was targeted and killed by a US drone strike in Somalia. Um, cynics would say there was a connection there. Um, they would also note, perhaps, that Saka's friend Bilal Bajawi was killed just a month earlier, uh, several minutes after he made a phone call home to congratulate his wife on the birth of their son. Um, whatever you think of the British government's intention of uh, its increased use of powers such as this, um, you can certainly read the intent to do it in the code again. Um, here's the code for doing it. 
This is how you strip a British person of their citizenship. Uh, this is a record of amendments, starting with the um, British Nationality Act of 1981, an act that served to codify and decide you know, what constituted being a, a British citizen was. And this, the Nationality the Immigration and Asylum Act of 2002, the, Nationality, the Immigration and Asylum Nationality Act of 2006, um, and this, which is currently between the Commons and the Lords, this is the new Theresa May Amendment, you may or may not have heard about, uh, of the Immigration Bill 2013, they hoped, now 2014, in progress. Um, each one of these subtly changes the, the language of the law, right? It changes a few lines at a time so that the law produces something else. Um, the interesting bit is here. Well, first of all, it goes like, it starts, it changes some language here, but the main bit is this thing about conducive to the public good. Um, conducive to the public good they thought would be enough um, because uh, it was uh, substantially stronger than earlier language. Uh, conducive to the public good allows them to strip some of their citizenship as long as it doesn't leave them stateless, right? So you can remove someone's citizenship um, only if they have dual nationality. Um, that's weird because lots of those people have that nationality only by kind of default. I, they have a right to that other nationality. They may, like Mohammed Saka, never have taken it up. Um, but technically under UN law you can't leave someone stateless. However, under UN law, and this is the uh, United Nations Convention on Statelessness from 1981, um, 1980, I think, um, you can render someone stateless if they've done something uh, that is um, uh, prejudicial to the vital interests of the state. So, here we go, 2014, um, they may remove it, has conducted himself in a manner which is seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the state. It's kind of alignment of language, an alignment of the code. But it's basically an exploit, right? It's figuring out an example of the ways <laughs> that these overlapping layers of law or code can be re-engineered to produce different outcomes. Uh, from an act designed to kind of safeguard the nationality of British citizens to a document that's designed to expel them. That's what I mean, again, about reading intent into these systems, performing this brass rubbing, finding these kind of voids and inceptions within law and code that reveal them to be kind of frameworks of intent. And I like frameworks. Frameworks are good things. Um, that doesn't have to be a bad thing, necessarily. This is something I did, made back in 2010, called the Wikipedia Historiography. Um, it's a book of and about Wikipedia. Um, the thing that's awesome about Wikipedia is not just that it's um, kind of a repository for all human knowledge, or might be, could be, is designed to be. Um, it's also a framework for how we construct that knowledge, right? The ways in which the uh, Wikimedia software encourages you to you know, contribute, shape the work, format it, shapes the kind of knowledge that is produced by it. That's a fairly obvious point, but one of the other things that Wikipedia does is it allows you to see that framework very clearly. Um, the Wikipedia historiography is not an article, it's not a set of articles. It's a, it's a single article, the article in the Iraq War, but it's a history, but it's a change log. It's a history of every edit made to that article over an eight year period. Um, it shows the bones of that framework. It shows how that, um, that article has come to be, how we've constructed Wiki the Wikipedian cultural version of the history of the Iraq War. Not just a final version, but an argument in process, culture itself. You know, endless arguments over what will constitute our kind of cultural remembering of this thing. And it's possible because it's a transparent and actionable and open source tool that allows you to go into it and pull out its own history. It's been deliberately constructed that way. Would that more of our civic frameworks were constructed in such a way? Or, you know, perhaps that's how we need to be designing them. Um, I'm currently talking a lot to these guys who are great. Um, this is the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. And they have an awesome name and they're very serious people. Uh, it's, it's a coalition of over 100 NGOs, non-governmental campaigning organizations, people like Amnesty, people like Human Rights Watch, and, and many, many more. Um, uh, and they're addressing the issue of autonomous weapons, right? Which is not really this guy. Um, like, this was a PR stunt, they're happy to, uh, very much do it. It's, it's not this guy, it's not drones either. Um, it doesn't mean the Terminator, it means like the systems behind it. It means like artificial intelligence. It means complex network systems that are getting quite close to having the power to decide whether people live or die. Right? This is the next thing that is happening on the battlefield. 
we're kind of close to it now. If you, on the, on the uh, Korean DMZ, for example, there are sentry guns there that could kill people. At the moment, there's a switch that sets them to like telling a human operator who makes the decision. But Samsung, who makes them, are very good at this stuff, and they don't actually need to do that yet. Um, but the thing is, the Killer Robots campaign is trying to put the case about why we need arms control here. Um, and they, they, as I say, they're good at this. These are the same guys, a lot of them, who got the cluster munitions and landmines stuff passed. Like they've got form in this area. But the problem is, is simply talking about this stuff. Like how do you explain to people what these issues that we're concerned about? Because you're running into the same problems as everyone else who talks about technology. You're talking about something immaterial. You're, you can't point at it, it's hard to draw a picture of it. Um, it's hard to communicate what an autonomous system is without you know, turning up with a silly mannequin robot. Um, history is instructive here. Um, there's something called Article 36 of the Geneva Conventions, uh, which was added to the conventions in 1977. And what it does is it mandates research uh, and assessment of new weapons to ensure that they uh, conform to the existing rules of war, uh, appropriate, proportionate, won't kill too many kind of innocent bystanders, that kind of thing. There is an approval process for new weapons, and it's encoded in the Geneva Convention. Of course, it, you know, it's more complicated than that. It didn't do its job well enough, it was too easily ignored. So in 1980, they added something, and I kid you not, and I have to read this book quite carefully. The United Nations Convention on Prohibitions or Restrictions on the Use of Certain Conventional Weapons, which may be deemed to be excessively injurious or to have indiscriminate effects. That's the Treaty of 1980. In 1997, we finally got the Ottawa Convention, which is officially known as the Convention on the Prohibition of Use, Stockpiling, Production, and Transfer of Antipersonnel Mines, and on their destruction. So that's the landmine stuff that was added as a further addendum later. Right? That took 20 years of argument. Uh, international governmental lawyers are now once again saying, when we start talking about autonomous weapons, it's okay, Article 36 has got this. Right? It's all right, we already have a framework for addressing this. But the point is that we've seen like illegible frameworks are far too easily manipulated by power. Right? Um, technology loves generating frameworks, though, and we've developed a whole bunch of really good kind of assessment tools for them. Like, I'm starting to think maybe we could actually like brute force the fuzz testing of kind of weird new weapons against Article 36. Right? There's a whole kind of raft of stuff to be generated. But in the wider sphere, my point is that we kind of bringing a technologically literate eye to these other problems, not just saying building the thing, but like we've developed a whole different approach to systems over here in the last 20 years of network communication. We're gonna come bring it back for the other stuff as well. You know, some of these arguments and solutions, they weren't within our grasp before, but we've, we've been paying attention. Because technology is, is culture too. Digital culture, network culture, all of that stuff. It's not some weird algorithm. It's the center, it's the beam, it's what we're doing and it's what, how we tell these stories to ourselves. Um, we spend, it feels like, every single discussion about new technologies talking about, like, does it make things better or worse? Is everything going too fast or is it slowing down? Um, like, do, it, are these things that we're getting because of technology, are they genuinely new or is it just the same thing all over again? Right? It's rubbish. Technology is not good or not bad, certainly not neutral. But the thing that's kind of transformed throughout all of this is, is us and our way of seeing and understanding the world. When we see and understand the rainbow plane, we gain access to a system of systems that was previously completely inaccessible to us. Right? We don't just learn about satellite imaging and space travel, photography, communication. We're engaged in the study and critique of the systems that generate themselves, the crucial social, legal, political, moral, technological systems that generate the world around us. So, as I asked the render ghosts, as, as I realized in, uh, in, in Los Alamos, when I asked that question like, what is technology for? What is the network for? It's for, it's for addressing this world, revealing it, and therefore kind of potentially, possibly changing it. I'm done, thank you very much.
James, you spend a lot of time, I think, trying to make technologies more legible or, more, or at least more visible mm -hmm. to people. And uh, I think part of that effort is about trying to enable us to, to read or to critique the changes that these things are having on uh, the way we behave. How optimistic are you that the kind of ethical, our, our, our critical ethical faculties around these technologies will catch up with the kind of legal and practical processes that you've described? Um, we, as, yeah, I'm totally optimistic. Um, well, beca because, I, because I think they've lagged behind for, shall I talk about, um, like I think they've lagged behind for so long. It's not, I wouldn't say they can't get any worse, but like, that they can definitely get a lot better. And like, they can get, it feels like they can get better more easily than they get worse. Like, we've really got these tools we didn't have access to before. Like, the, so many of the things we've been trying to do feel like we just haven't had the tools for them before. So if we're constantly generating new tools, we must be generating at least new opportunities to kind of improve the situation. Um, so many of the technologies as well, they do seem to have this kind of insistence on transparency at the core. And transparency isn't magic. In fact, I think particularly in the last year, we've seen with the NSA GCHQ stuff, for example, the fact that actually transparency doesn't kind of magically make anything better. In fact, it can kind of codify a lot of the worst stuff. But all of these things are, are improvements in our understanding. Uh, there's, we can't go back from this point. Um, yeah, that's, that's what makes me optimistic about it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I really like that your work seems to be, some of it anyway, exposes the fact that a lot of this stuff is open and out there, a lot of this data is open already when people think of it closed and hidden. So this whole idea of transparency, like unintentional transparency is out there. Do you think that the, um, I'm, I should, I'm, uh, I'm from the Open Data Institute, so I'm really sort of advocating this already, but do you think that there's a lot of um, data and information that's available that people think isn't, and that the, the fear of opening up data is maybe not necessarily, th th it maybe sh shouldn't necessarily be there because a lot of stuff is open already, we just don't know about it. So it's about understanding. Um, yeah, in, in much of the open stuff, we're not necessarily having to talk at the level of kind of whistleblowers and massive kind of leaks. We're just talking about the fact this information is there, as you say. And that could be anything from kind of planning documents to kind of aircraft registration logs or kind of any of that kind of stuff. Um, the first and obvious point is that like, we have access to that stuff now. Um, not always. Sometimes you have to go to a building and you have to ask someone for a piece of paper and all that kind of stuff. Surprising amounts of it are online. But that's the kind of, and, you know, searchable and all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of obvious stuff. I think for me though, again, it's, it's about this attitude that becoming literate in the technology is kind of engendered. It gives you this kind of sense of power. Um, uh, power as in confidence in order to do the things, to go and look for things, to go and ask for them. Um, it's not necessarily that, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's that, that um, many of the skills that, it, that we're teaching now uh, and I don't just mean literally learning to code, which kind of is the big buzzword at the moment, but just the, the skills that we are learning to survive in a more networked world are skills that inherently press us to go out and kind of investigate this stuff more or less. Again, that comes back to this kind of optimism thing. Like, I think we are teaching ourselves through these technologies the skills that we need. And one of those is to be, to make better use of this kind of information that is available to us all the time. Um, but, you know, and, and, and optimistic in the sense of, uh, things like the work that the ODI is doing, many of the people who may be resistant to this, you know, they, they don't get the choice in it in the end. Um, this is the way that the kind of the impetus of the technology is built. And if there's an intent in the technology, I'm not entirely sure that that intent to to render transparent was entirely unintentional. Um, I wanted to ask whether you feel that making the Iraq book, which is a book, you're, you're generating an object, that's something which is without an object, no? 
What does rendering it into an object, um, and especially technology which is prior to the technology we're talking about and things like that, what does it add to the idea that you're trying to suggest? Um, so my background in large part is as a publisher. I was a literary editor and, and also involved in book production and all this kind of st stuff. So one of my first instincts on being confronted with stuff is quite often just to print it out, uh, often in the form of a book, just to get it like out in that way. And I've, I've done a lot of projects which just involve kind of printing out stuff. And they've largely been about printing out intangible stuff, printing out data, printing out this contents of databases. The Wikipedia book is like, it's a really weak hand. Like, it's not, a, it's not sophisticated, it's not clever. Um, it shouldn't be necessary, but like, there's still kind of a big old animal brain in there that's struggling to conceptualize the weight of this stuff. And I don't think, I don't think there's anything wrong with using like, the tools and the objects that our brains and our bodies are more familiar with to make those points. We have to be careful, you know, which of those metaphors are useful, because some of them may be harmful, many of them may be harmful. Um, but at the same time, you know, a book is a measure of information. Um, you know, we, we understand its weight, its heft. We understand also, I think, always particularly for me, the work that it's gone into it. Like we value it not just as a quantity of information, but as a quality of information. So, you're, you know, you're, I hope in that work, I'm making quite a directed point about about the value and the amount of the information kind of contained in here. Um, I've probably done other ones with books that are a bit more flippant than that, but I think with the Wikipedia book it holds. I was just simply going to ask you what you're kind of working on in the next few months, or if you've got something that you'd like to, you know, piece of research that you're um, kind of developing at the moment that perhaps all of this ties into, or that maybe you're departing from, or, you know, where's, where's your sort of head at at the moment, if I may ask? Um, I mean, here, like there, right there. I had, you know, I, I had coffee with the, the Killer Robots people yesterday. Uh, they were having a conference today. That's kind of why that came last, because it's at the forefront of my mind. Um, but on, on and, and so why I'm hoping to do more is kind of evolve this idea of, of, of regarding things like legislation as, as systems and code and, and seeing what comes of making that assumption about them. But, but the, 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 the kind of longer stretch is that, you know, the last couple of years has been things like the drone works, which, are, are, which I'm very, very proud of, but are quite naive visualizations, you know? They're, they're just, they literally are just drawing the thing. And that's brilliant and it's great and it does a lot, but I'm kind of done with going, look, I have made you a space for debate. Like, you know, um, like we 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 we're getting better at these tools now. Like it's not enough just starting a discussion. I think I think we can do more with them. Um, and that's you know I may be being too naive activist about that. I still want to generate like tools and frameworks that have wider applications than just purely political effect. But but I think as a like a real test of the strength of ideas, that seems like quite powerful ground on which to test them. Go to the bar. <laughs> One more. Um, so uh, it, it, it's quite quite interesting the sort of uh, idea of an activist group that already existed in the form of this this was it called Unity this, this group that yeah. came to you about the the immigration stuff and um, their interest in accessing data that ostensibly is already open and it just makes me think about the difference between sort of open and available and actually accessible to everyone, right? And I just, I just wonder if you have any thought about how we get from there's lots of stuff on the internet to people actually know it's there, know how to get to it, and actually make use of it, right? Because why, why does it take, why does it take a, a, a strong narrative for a group that really wants this sort of data to be able to know that it's already there, right? And so, I mean, how can we, how can we short circuit that process for the next thing, right? Um, I guess this is the question. Yeah, just a small question. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, um, 
like what you're talking about is is the thing about everything new is that it's unevenly distributed, right? So that the stuff is there, but the skills to access it and everything else are known to some and not known to others. And um, what are we what are we teaching here? Are we, well, what are we trying to share or what are we trying to spread? Um, which I, you know, I, I think is this technological literacy thing I keep going back to. It's instructive to look at what the genuine obstacles to that are, you know, because some of them are just big and obvious. Like we don't, we're bad at, we're bad at both sides of it, right? We're not very good at teaching and talking about technology, and we're also, um, we're not very good at making it, frankly. <laughs> like many of the tools that we have just aren't very good, and we need to take more responsibility for those tools. Uh, but but you know primarily we need you know both of those things can be helped by better modes of communication of this stuff. So you know as I keep saying the better metaphors of this stuff, the better way of understanding, and that will start smaller and it will start in specific areas. And it can be done differently in different areas. It can be done differently by different disciplines, literature and art and design, blurrings between those things. Right? Each of those has their own languages to address these issues. It's not like art has never addressed immaterial things before. <laughs> That's a pretty ridiculous thing to say. Like we have kind of ways of approaching it. Um, but, uh, but it will take time. But th there's also, you know, there is, there is also a lot of, there is a countervailing narrative. Like there is a, there's a very wide sort of set of beliefs that says in various forms that technology is bad. There is a fear of this stuff. And understanding the kind of the locus and the origin of that fear and why it's endlessly kind of reinforced, I think is really important. There's a w far wider issues here of kind of, I think, kind of anti-intellectualism in culture that kind of rejects technological knowledge over other forms of knowledge. I think that's really important to bear in mind as well. Um, we, but we can address all of those things, I think, through along kind of similar lines of, of discussion and, and education and, and, and kind of basic creativity. The, the tools of curiosity, I think, that are, that are central to this are also sort of central to simple creativity. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone. I think um, we have a lot of food for thought, but if we could carry on our conversations down in the bar, that would be great. Thank you very much. <laughs>